Dr. Paul Saladino is the leading authority on the science and application of the carnivore diet. He has used this diet to reverse autoimmune issues, chronic inflammation, and mental health issues in hundreds of patients, many of whom had been told their conditions were untreatable. He is the host of the popular Fundamental Health podcast and the author of the best-selling book, The Carnivore Code. Dr. Saladino is board certified as a physician, nutrition specialist, and in psychiatry and completed residency at the University of Washington. He lives in Austin, Texas, and can frequently be found exploring wild places when he is not writing, researching, or working with clients. Dr. Saladino, welcome to the Biohacking Secrets Show. Thanks for having me on, brother. It's good to be here. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to chat, especially for, for a little bit of selfish reasons, because I am yet to pull the trigger on the carnivore diet and try it. And I heard some stories from Kyle Kingsbury uh, at, at, at both ends of uh, a positive and not so positive experience. Um, you know, my buddy Mike Geary has been raving about it for, uh, for months and, and sending me your interviews to check out. So it's, it, I'm, I'm excited to dive in. Yeah, well, let's just start there. I mean, tell me about your hesitations and we can use that as a jumping off point because I think a lot of people may be similarly hesitant and then we can sort of get back around to what a carnivore diet is on the back end maybe. Perfect, perfect. So as I mentioned before, before we, we started the interview, uh, I had, I'm APOE E4, E4. Um, and you're going to probably correct me here, but my understanding of that is it's like, uh, it's, it, it basically refers to the type of bond that you have in transporting cholesterol and through your body and saturated fats and E4, E4 is a weaker bond, which increases your probability of Alzheimer's, uh, you know, 20 times if you have both. Um, and there's some speculation that if you eat a high, a, a, a diet high in fat, that, if you have that genetic variation, it could, you could end up with higher blood levels of lipids. Now, I have a feeling I butchered that in a few different places. So um, I, I'd like you to kind of come in and correct me and correct the audience so they're not like, oh, there's Anthony again, making, making shit up on the fly. <laughs> yeah, so ApoE4, I did a whole podcast about ApoE4. If people wanna hear that, they can check out my podcast, Fundamental Health. Did a whole podcast on ApoE4 with my buddy, Tommy Wood. And it's all there for people. I also talk about ApoE4 in detail in my book, The Carnivore Code. So I'll just do a quick screen share here. If you, if you just enable screen sharing, I'm a, yeah. I love doing this during interviews because I can show some research and I can show all kinds of cool stuff. So <clears throat> what's super interesting is if you, if you look at the research regarding ApoE4, most of it is, it's all, most of it is observational which means that so much of what we are told in the mainstream is just flat out wrong. And it's based on observational studies. And this is what I break down in the book. And this theme comes up over and over as we are repeatedly debunking myths about red meat, whether it's red meat causes cancer, red meat shortens your life, or red meat causes heart attacks. All of these claims that are widely circulated in the media are almost entirely based on a limited subset of observational data which is also known as epidemiology. So concerns regarding ApoE4 and saturated fat are epidemiology. They're not interventional studies. There's never been an interventional study where they took people like you who are E4, E4. And this is a, it's an isoform of this apolipoprotein E, um, which is the four molecule, the four isoform. They've never taken people with your genotype or even 3-4 or 3-3 three, three, or 2-3. Three. Three. There are three isoforms of ApoE. There's 2, 3, and 4. There's never done a study where they say, hey, you're going to eat more saturated fat for the next 10 years or 70 years, and you're going to eat less saturated fat for the next 70 years, and we'll see who gets more Alzheimer's. That's never been done. What we're looking at here are observational epidemiology studies, which are inherently flawed because we know correlation does not causation make, right? So the first part of this story is this. Did you know that the ancestral genotype is ApoE4? Meaning that your ancestors and my ancestors up until 200,000 years ago, all had ApoE4.4. Every single human on this planet up until 200,000 years ago was ApoE4.4. That is the ancestral genotype of ApoE, this apolipoprotein E, okay? Now, mm. people may know a little bit about human evolution. I go through all of this at the beginning of my book. I talk about how 
the very, there's a very large amount of evidence that eating meat shaped the formation of our larger brains, the development of the neocortex, and was this really this crucial spark in the development of a large brain that made us human from apes three to four million years ago as we transitioned from Australopithecus to Homo habilis and Homo erectus. But if you go back to 2 million years ago or 1.5 or 1 million years ago, or even 500,000 years ago, every single human on this planet was ABOE 4.4. ABOE 3 showed up about 200,000 years ago and ABOE 2 showed up about 80,000 years ago. Okay. So this to, is- to, to think I almost didn't ask you about <laughs> E4, E4 status and apolipoprotein E. You, you, you have the most well-versed knowledge on this of anyone I've talked to. Please keep going. Yeah. Before the podcast, you're like, have you ever heard of this thing, ApoE4? I was like, yeah, I wrote about it. I just did. I didn't want to spring it on you. <laughs> I got it, man. I got it. I wrote, 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 you got it covered. Got it. This is great. And so, so this is really interesting, right? So just think about it from that perspective. Most people, and I talk about this in the book, most people can kind of get behind the idea that humans have been eating a lot of meat and meat has saturated fat. And I, you, I also just recently did a whole podcast with Nina Teicholz about how saturated fat has been wrongly vilified for the last 70 years by Ansel Keys and the Seven Countries Study, which is more horrible epidemiology. And if people want to know, you know why saturated fat is incredibly healthy, uh, they can listen to that podcast as well. There's so many rabbit holes we could go down. But as I said, there's great anthropologic evidence and ethnographic evidence, archaeologic evidence that humans have been eating a lot of meat for 2.53 million years. And that that inciting event, when we became hunters three million years ago, that's when the human brain began to really grow in size. There's evidence for bifacial tools, which are Acheulean tools. There's evidence for butchering on bones. There's evidence for mass graves of animals. And there's evidence for hunting in terms of other tools and weapon implements. There's all kinds of stuff saying, hey, humans are hunters from 3 million years ago. So to suggest that humans have not been eating meat and not been eating meat that's rich in saturated fat for 3 million years is a little bit of an evolutionary incongruity. Most people can understand, yeah, we've been eating a lot of meat, but overlay just, that on- Just the- on, that, on that point, I want you to continue. I'm just thinking and playing the devil's advocate here. I, I tried hunting for the first time, tried bow hunting elk in Idaho last September. I didn't even see an elk, let alone kill an elk. And I'm not a good hunter. It was my first time, as I mentioned, I was with some, some decent hunters, some guys that have experience. So I've also reflected on the fact that like, man, wasn't it kind of hard to kill stuff and have enough meat for people to be eating tons of meat, especially when you think about storage, refrigerators not existing. What, what are your thoughts on that? And then I would like you to continue where you, where you were. So we don't know. I wish I had a time machine and you and I could go back to 2 million years ago. But the other thing is, remember all these fossils? You ever seen these fossils? Like in San Diego recently, they were doing some renovations on a highway and they haven't covered a massive woolly mammoth graveyard. Okay. What? There, yeah, there was, a, there, there was a major extinction, you know, within the last 50,000 years, 50,000 years, there's been a mass extinction of megafauna. These are very big animals. The biggest animals today are not that big compared to animals of the past. A lot of people estimate that woolly mammoth were three to four times the size of an elephant, which is hard for us to even wrap our head around. So you gotta think, like we don't really know what the landscape looked like for those people, but first of all, there were a, a small amount of them and they were in Africa where there are very big animals now, giraffe, elephant, they didn't look like the animals of today, but the hypothesis is there was a heck of a lot of animals around and then something happened 50 to 10 to 15,000 years ago. And this is actually, there are so many rabbit holes to go down here. This is actually believed to be something called the Younger Dryass period. And uh, people hypothesize it was a meteor impact. This is Graham Hancock. And um, people like this are saying, hey, there was this major catastrophe in human history that wiped out, we believe, 75% of the species on this planet about 12,500 years ago. People can go down that rabbit hole. And this is all these archeological sites like Gobekli Tepe, which are built in Turkey 12,000 years ago and suggest previous knowledge of complex sort of knowledge of building and religion and art, even predating this advent of agriculture 12,500 years ago. But there appears to have been these major catastrophic events in, on the human earth. Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson talk about this with geology. So, the, my point here is that we don't know what species were around. We see these fossils now. 
Just like we see dinosaur fossils from many millions of years ago, we see woolly mammoth fossils from tens of thousands of years ago, but there were different animals on the planet than there are now. Yeah. And there were a lot less humans hunting those very big, very different animals at the time. So there's plenty of evidence for hunting in the anthropologic archeologic record. Like I said, there are these tools, there's actual bones you can find that have cut marks on them. There are mass graveyards of animals where it appears that our ancestors were smart enough as their brains were growing from eating animal foods and these unique nutrients and animal foods, they would herd these animals into blind canyons and just kill them all or push them off cliffs. And you can imagine that if you're in a tribe of 20 or 30 people and you kill an elephant or a woolly mammoth, you're gonna eat for weeks, man. So there's pretty good evidence of this. And then even I'm on, more I'm on board. <laughs> that, even looking at stable isotope studies from 50,000 years ago, comparing Neanderthal and Northern European Homo sapiens, which is about the time that Neanderthal were around 50,000 years ago, there's pretty good evidence that, that we were eating mostly meat. And you can look at the stable isotopes and teeth and bones, get a sense of where a species is getting its protein from. And multiple studies point to the same, the same fact, which is that humans were pretty high level trophic carnivores, meaning we were eating the majority of our food as animals because of the way we see these stable isotopes, this nitrogen, sulfur, and barium, and calcium in these remains in our teeth and bones and collagen tissues. So there's a lot of good evidence that says, hey, we were eating mostly animals. We were mainly hunters. We actually had more of these stable nitrogen isotopes, it's an N15 isotope, than other known carnivores like hyenas. So you can compare a human bone to a hyena bone, and then you say, hey, wait, we had even more of this nitrogen that tends to bioaccumulate when you're eating animals that are bigger and bigger. So we were probably eating more animals and bigger animals than known carnivores like hyenas. It's not to say we weren't eating any plants. We can get to that and sort of where I believe plants have always lived in the sort of uh, hierarchy of foods for humans and, and indications of that from currently living indigenous hunter-gatherers. But uh, there's a lot of good evidence we were eating a lot of meat. So, and yeah, I remember, can buy let's go back to the ApoE4 story. It doesn't make any sense that we would have had this genotype that led us to live less long or that led us to lead less uh, mentally clear, fluid lives when the majority of the food we were eating had saturated fat. Right? So this is kind of an evolutionary incongruity. Yes. Most people hypothesize that ApoE4 is protective against parasitic infection. And we see there are tribes of currently living hunter-gatherers, specifically the Semain and the Yoruba. Uh, this, I think it's Bolivian. Uh, the Bolivian Semain and the Yoruba are somewhere else. Maybe I got to look up the, the paper. I'll pull it up for you. But in both of these, in both of these populations, You'll love this. ApoE4 polymorphisms correlate with improved mental clarity and sharpness and memory tasks as they I feel, age. I feel sharp as a tack. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So indigenous, within indigenous hunter-gatherer groups, specifically the Semain and the Yoruba, there have been studies to show that, hey, ApoE4 does not inevitably lead to dementia and problems, people with ApoE4 polymorphisms in these indigenous groups actually do better than their non-ApoE4 counterparts. And again, the, the thinking here is that this is related to, um, this is related to the, the protective effect that this may have when there are pathogens in the environment. So, and that kind of would make sense evolutionarily. That do you have any idea of the mechanism on that? Well, you know, it, it gets to be a little complex. I don't think- Yeah, anyone, I, I take us on a tangent. Keep it Yeah, yeah. Stay, stay I don't focused. think anyone really knows. <laughs> I, but, I say stay focused. I'm talking yeah. to myself. Please keep We going. can, you know, we can, uh, you know, yeah. Um, we, can, we can hypothesize. It probably has something to do with the way that these isoforms interact with bacteria or something about the protectiveness. But ApoE4, ApoE is used in the brain to move cholesterol between neurons and astrocytes. And so- in the, the discordance here becomes that in, in a normal, or I should say, in westernized cultures, modernized cultures, ApoE4 polymorphisms are associated, right? Keyword associated, this is observational data, with worse 
mental health outcomes. But in indigenous groups, they're associated with better mental health outcomes. So what's going on here? Well, what we know is that mainstream or you know, moder modernity, civilized groups also have other chronic diseases and have way more insulin resistance. And so the story that begins to emerge, the story that I tell in the book, and the story that I talk about with Tommy Wood is that ApoE4 appears to be very bad if you become insulin resistant. So ApoE4 is an evolutionary mismatch for 2020 when people are eating Cheetos and vegetable oil, but it's not an evolutionary mismatch for the last 3 million years if you're a hunter-gatherer or you are eating like a hunter-gatherer. So to become insulin resistant with ApoE4 is very bad. And in the setting of insulin resistance, the ApoE4 isoform, the, the 4 isoform of ApoE4 appears to work less well at moving cholesterol between astrocytes and neurons. But if you are insulin sensitive, ApoE4 is probably not a problem at all, and it may even be protective. So to tell people to avoid a fat that's found in what I believe are the healthiest, most nutrient dense foods on the planet, based on observational research that completely misses this, this evolutionary incongruity is really misleading in my opinion. And that's what really frustrates me to no end <laughs> over and over. So I'll screen share, I'll just screen share this. So this is a, that, from my book really is, again. is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote about this in my book, a carnivore diet with an ApoE4 polymorphism. Yeah, guys, if you're, if you're not sold already, you're not listening with both your ears, go <laughs> pick up, go pick up the carnivore code, Paul Saladino's <laughs> book. Um, and please continue, sir. Yeah, but as you see, I wrote here, you know, but as we've seen from the Semaine and the Yoruba, ApoE4 does not appear to be harmful in insulin sensitive populations. Why is there such a strong association between this genetic variant and Alzheimer's disease in Westerners? When 88% of the population demonstrates metabolic dysfunction and insulin resistance, of course, ApoE4 looks bad. So that's really, again, there's a whole part of the book. The book has 650 references, and I'm going to pull up a study to show you guys the Semaine here, the Semaine. Um, people can look at this or and again, these, all these studies are referenced in my book. So this is super interesting. Inflammatory gene variants in the Semaine, an indigenous Bolivian population with a high infectious load. So what they found here was that, and again, there's a lot of words here, but what they found was that no significant differences in ApoE, CRP, which is C-reactive protein and IL-6 variants across age were found. Uh, CRP levels were higher in carriers of two CRP pro-inflammatory SNPs, whereas they were lower in carriers of ApoE4. So mm. people are probably already connecting the dots there. Basically, they're saying that levels of inflammation were lower in people that had ApoE4 within this indigenous population. So what's going on here? Again, this is what's so important. And what I talk about with Tommy in that podcast, it's all about the context, right? It's about the context and the context that we exist in within, uh, within a westernized society is predominantly insulin resistant. And when you are insulin resistant, ApoE4 begins to look very, very bad. But if you are not insulin resistant, ApoE4 is probably protective. Yet another study just to connect these two, ApoE4, the door to insulin resistant dyslipidemia and brain fog, it's a case study just saying that in someone who has ApoE4, becoming insulin resistant is very, very bad. Now, what's fascinating about this case study, you'll love this, is that this is a 10-week trial. This is a 10-week trial of someone who actually had ApoE4. They were heterozygous, so they were ApoE3-4. They had a dual diagnosis of mild Alzheimer's disease and type 2 diabetes. And what they did in this patient was they put him on a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, which is going to be high in saturated fat, okay? So they did exactly what you're not supposed to do in this patient. Presumably, you know, they, were, they, were, they understood what a ketogenic diet or a low carbohydrate diet could do in this situation. The results were <laughs> that the patient's baseline MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, improved from 23 to 29, which means he went from mild Alzheimer's disease to normal. His type two diabetes was reversed. His hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of the average 90 day blood glucose went from 7.8 to 5.5. 5. 
the patient achieved statistically significant improvements in the other aforementioned biomarkers of metabolic syndrome. So basically what they're saying here, the results of this case study suggest that a clinically prescribed ketogenic diet has strong potential to, resource, to restore systemic insulin sensitivity and metabolic flexibility in diabetic ApoE4 heterozygous carriers. This is so cool. So here's an actual interventional study in somebody with ApoE4. Admittedly, they're ApoE3-4, they're heterozygous, but they improved this guy's cognitive functioning by giving him a ketogenic diet that was high in saturated fat. It's only just like case closed, you know, we're done. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it's fascinating. And so what, what I'm kind of thinking here that you've pointed out is with, with E4, um, we've only really, we, we've been myopic on the food connection. We've never really done the laboratory research and we don't know, like there's a lot of things that have changed in our world that could also be responsible. EMFs, chronic infections, plastic, glyphosate, metals, like it could, it could be related to something, something else. And we're seeing studies that contradict the misconception that if you give a high saturated fat diet to someone with, with either homozygous or heterozygous E4, uh, it's going to have a negative effect or increase their risk of Alzheimer's. Exactly. And the other point to illustrate here, this is the danger of epidemiology. You can find epidemiology observational studies that say that people who eat more saturated fat tend to do worse when they have ApoE4. But I want to highlight this for the listeners so they really understand. That doesn't mean that the saturated fat caused the problem. <laughs> and who eats more saturated fat within the mainstream in 2020 or 2010 when the study was done? It's not you and me. They're not eating good quality saturated fat. They're eating bad quality saturated fat. And if they're eating saturated fat, part of it could be trans fat, could be hydrogenated. And they're also probably more likely to smoke, less likely to exercise, more likely to be obese, more likely to drink alcohol, less likely to seek medical care. Basically, these are people who disregard mainstream medical advice. This is called the unhealthy user bias. And it repeatedly confounds epidemiology. Saturated fat repeatedly associates with worse health outcomes, but if you look at interventional studies, you see the completely opposite thing happening. And this happens over and over and over in medicine. We see associations, but it's not the saturated fat. It's all the other unhealthy behaviors that people who are rebellious enough to eat saturated fat do, right? Who eats a hamburger at McDonald's with nothing else? No one. You, you know what? Uh, Dr. Jaquish from exactly. uh, Jaquish Metal, Medical. But he's an was outlier. Talking, yes, he's an outlier. He's, he's an outlier. outlier right? <laughs> so they're eating a milkshake with processed sugar. They're eating secret yep. sauce on their Big Mac, which has vegetable oil. They're eating a bun, which has vegetable oil. And mm -hmm. they're eating, you know, and who goes to a barbecue and doesn't have potato salad with canola oil in it? Along Someone with who's, their, who's un American. Damn right. <laughs> along, with your, along with your hamburger with saturated fat. So Epidemiology cannot tell you if it's the potato salad, the canola oil, the milkshake, or the hamburger, but interventional mm -hmm. studies can, and those tell a very different story. So in the podcast today with Nina Teicholz, we review a number of interventional studies. So there have been interventional studies where they take one group and they go higher saturated fat and another group and they go lower saturated fat and guess who does worse? the lower saturated fat groups do worse. They have more strokes, they have more heart attacks, and they die more because they're replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated vegetable oil. So just to tie a bow on all of this, the real key thing here is insulin sensitivity. I'm gonna say that a lot in this podcast, insulin sensitivity. In my book, I talk about how to be insulin sensitive and what creates insulin resistance, but all you guys listening, I'm just gonna drop that knowledge on you right now. The main factor, causing insulin resistance in humans is excess polyunsaturated oil. This is mainly linoleic acid, which is an 18 carbon polyunsaturated fatty acid and it's an omega-6 and it seems to wreak havoc on our metabolism. Some people will say carbohydrates cause insulin resistance, that is false. And I've shown that repeatedly in my own experiments and other people's experiments. In the setting of insulin resistance, carbohydrates can fan the flames 
but polyunsaturated vegetable oils, which are something our ancestors would have really almost never eaten, they would have favored saturated fats, which are the ones that get demonized, right? Saturated fats lead to insulin sensitivity. Polyunsaturated fats lead to insulin resistance. So the take home really here is if you're ApoE4, avoid vegetable oil, corn, canola, peanuts, soy, safflower, like the plague, and know how much linoleic acid is in your diet. So anyway, we have opened up about 10,000 cans of worms now, but I love that we started there. Yeah. Okay. So to, to kind of close that loop for someone that, that wants to check their labels and make sure they're not taking in any polyunsaturated vegetable oils, what are some of the names that they should look out for and avoid on the oh, ingredients? I just said those. So corn, canola, safflower, sunflower, soybean, peanut, all okay. those. Perfect. And if you're eating processed food, you're getting polyunsaturated vegetable oil. Now, there are layers to this onion and unfortunately, humans can get excess linoleic acid by eating chicken and pigs that are fed corn and soy. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons that I am such a big proponent of ruminant meat, red meat, that is well-raised, regeneratively raised red meat, is that ruminants don't put polyunsaturated oils into their fat in the same way that monogastric animals like chickens and pigs do. So chickens and pigs, if you feed them corn and soy, are going to be like little vegetable oil factories. And so you got to be careful where your food comes from. And you really want to eat food that is eating a species appropriate diet. So yes. So the first step is no vegetable oils in your diet whatsoever in any way, shape or form. The second is try to eat grass fed, grass finished red meat as the majority of your meat. Be aware that the chicken and pork that you are eating is eating corn and soy, unless you are sure it's not, and that is going to have a higher percentage of linoleic acid. Now, that's not the main problem. The main problem for most people is the vegetable oils, but it's another source. That's fascinating. So what you're saying is because, because uh, ruminant meat um, stores the vegetable oils differently, even if I may be putting words in your mouth here, so <laughs> jump in and correct me. Even if you had to say, maybe you didn't for a meal or two have access to a grass-fed, grass-finished piece of meat, you still would be less likely to take in at least polyunsaturated vegetable oil toxins from the ruminant meat than you would if you were eating like a factory, you know, so like a factory farmed cow versus a factory farmed uh, chicken. Yeah, that's, that that's correct. There's different biochemistry. And again, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for grass fin finishing and grass feeding yeah. of animals. I, don't, especially I can't see myself really wanting to eat anything else. Yeah, right. But um, the ruminants have the ability to, to turn polyunsaturated fatty acids in their diet into saturated fatty acids in their fat. They have a unique biochemistry. Humans can't do that. Humans don't make polyunsaturated fatty acids. So we need a small amount of them, but we can get plenty of both omega-3 and omega-6 in ruminant fat or egg yolks. But monogastric animals, humans, pigs, chickens, we store polyunsaturated fatty acid so that if you feed a chicken corn and soy, its fat is going to have much, much more linoleic acid in it than a wild chicken, whatever that is. And if you are feeding a pig corn and soy, its fat is going to have more linoleic acid. Similarly, if you feed a human corn and soy or those oils, a human's fat is going to be enriched in linoleic acid. And I believe that that is one of the biggest signals to our body that winter is coming and that we need to get fat. And the way that humans get fat is they get insulin resistant, especially this combination of carbohydrates and polyunsaturated vegetable oils, that is a big, big problem for humans metabolically. And this is why ketogenic diets work in the short term. If you remove carbohydrates, you can remove part of the signal that fans the flames of insulin resistance. I'm jumping around, but I have some concerns about long-term low carbohydrate diets, but ultimately carbohydrates do not cause the insulin resistance metabolically. They only fan the flames. It's the mm -hmm. polyunsaturated vegetable oils. And I think there's a lot of good evidence for this that are the real molecular signal to our body that we need to get fat because winter is about to show up. Mm -hmm. And then you have the, the aspect of 
grains, which are, are present in a lot of carbohydrates and glyphosate and certain things that then can have a, a, a subsequent domino effect on our metabolism in other ways and, and, and via the gut microbiome and that sort of thing. Okay, so I'm seeing it. And we're going to come back in a little bit just to drop a teaser to, you know, sample menus and budget carnivore and that sort of thing. But let's, let's talk a little bit about plants. Um, unless you have more stuff that we should cover on the meat side. I'm, I'm, you've, you've addressed my major objections and concerns. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of these unknown plant toxins, sure. how they can affect people, and some of the ways that someone could, you know, who's listening to this podcast, could be doing what they believe to be everything right and actually keeping themselves stuck in an autoimmune loop or some sort of chronic health issue or even just brain fog and suboptimal performance. Yeah, I love that. That's basically one of the main reasons I wrote the book was to frame it in this way. There are two theses of the carnivore code. The first one we've really begun to address a little bit, which is that red meat has been incorrectly vilified for the last 70 years based on observational epidemiology that's done poorly. And it's an integral part of every human's ideal optimal diet, especially meat and organs, which we can talk about later, the importance of eating nose to tail. And secondly, the second premise, the second thesis of the book is that plants exist on a toxicity spectrum. And this is something that's kind of foreign to most people. A lot of people may be able to get on board. Okay, meat is healthy, but haven't our ancestors always eaten meat and plants? And I think they have, but I, here's my hypothesis. And this is one of the theses that I advance in the book. Our ancestors have used plants as survival food, as fallback food. And they have consistently, both in historics, historically, and looking at currently living hunter-gatherers, they have used plants as fallback foods while animals consistently serve as the main food that humans are hunting. If humans can get an animal, they are going to conserve, they're going to consume that preferentially above all other sources of nutrition because the nutrition in animals is so much more bioavailable and it's so much more complete than, than the nutrition in plants. Every statement- Spe Especially once you cook it. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of nuance here. All of those statements are rabbit holes that we can go further down. But you have to imagine, and this is what I want to really tell people, and it's, it's dovetailing off your question, that plants do exist on a toxicity spectrum. And I draw that spectrum in the book. So in chapter 12 of the book, I give ideas of how to eat a carnivore diet. I outline five tiers of a carnivore diet. And the first tier of a carnivore diet is actually a carnivore-ish type diet. And I give people a sense of which plant foods are the most toxic and which plant foods are the least toxic, in my opinion. Now, as you're suggesting, a lot of the foods that are more toxic are foods that we traditionally think of as healthy. And the foods that we think of as least toxic are foods that have recently gotten shunned. So the more toxic foods are the stems, roots, leaves, and seeds of plants. Think about the way a plant lives on this earth. It's rooted in the ground. It's like you and I are at the beach and I'm gonna bury you up to your neck in the sand. And then to make fun of you, I'm gonna paint your face like a soccer ball. And then all of a sudden this busload of irascible six-year-olds rolls up and they're coming from soccer practice and they don't have a soccer ball. You are going to feel vulnerable. You're stuck in the ground and you look like something that these kids can kick. That's how most plants have to feel. They're rooted in the ground. Look at those foliage. Look at that trees behind you. Look out my window at all the trees and plants. It can't move. If that were all edible, and if that were, you know, if that were something that you could just go and eat until you got full, there would be no plants around because that plant can't run away from you. If you see a squirrel or a rabbit or a deer or a buffalo or whatever, a woolly mammoth too many years ago, that animal can run away from you. It can bite you, it can gore you, it can step on you, it can kick you. But plants don't have any obvious defenses. Sometimes they have spikes, cacti, roses, but these chemical spikes are what plants have had to evolve out of necessity over the last 450 million years in their coevolution with animals. It's been an arms race. They've had to evolve toxins. And the more and more we look into botanical science, the more we see that plants are full, they are rife with toxins. There are thousands and thousands of these. 
And really only a few hundred have been studied to see what they do in humans. And many of these actually do appear to be quite harmful to human biology. Now, like I said, it's been an arms race, which means one country does something, the other country does something. One country does something, the other country does something. So plants evolve toxins, animals evolve mechanisms to detoxify. Plants evolve more toxins, animals evolve mechanisms to detoxify. There's no question that plants have toxins. The main question is how good are you? How good am I? How good is every individual listener at detoxifying the toxins in the plants they are eating? And this is where bio-individuality arrives. If people are not good at detoxifying plant toxins or they are particularly bad at detoxifying toxins in the plants they are eating or have been told are healthy for them, they could absolutely be fueling gut issues, inflammation, leaky gut, all of the attendant sequela of those, autoimmunity, all sorts of problems by eating things they believe to be healthy. And if you take a step back to the beginning and you think, okay, wait a minute, why am I eating plants in the first place? Well, I think your ancestors were eating plants in the first place because they couldn't get animals. So plants are survival food, right? So if you are eating plants, yeah, you can survive on plants for a little while, but you don't wanna make plants the majority of your diet. You definitely don't wanna live on just plants. The vegans have done that experiment for us and most of us know how that ends, which is sadly in a flaming inferno of nutritional catastrophe when you don't have animal food. <laughs> you, you need animal foods in your diet. And as I hinted at earlier, and as I talk about in the book, there are many nutrients in animal foods that simply don't even occur in plant foods. So there are these zoonutrients, these specialized nutrients. And if you shun all plant foods because you've been misled by bad science, you'll definitely become nutrient deficient. Absolutely. Now, if you choose to eat plants, which is fine, most people will, are there some plants that are more toxic than others? And yes. So if you think about it from a plant, go back to a plant's perspective. It doesn't want you to eat the majority of it, but every once in a while, it's going to make a fruit and it kind of wants you to eat its fruit, to spread that seed. So in the book, I've sort of created this spectrum of toxicity and what are the least toxic plant foods? They're fruit. The least toxic plant foods are fruit. Many foods that we think of as vegetables are actually fruit, avocado, squash, things like that. They're fruit. Now, in the book, I also include things like berries and other fruit as possible inclusions in a diet. But if someone wants to eat a carnivore-ish type diet or wants to exclude the most toxic plant foods, they would do well to exclude that spinach, those leafy greens that everyone says are so beneficial. Those are plants' leaves. Those plants do not want those to get eaten and they're gonna to go to great lengths to defend them. And we can talk about specific examples of toxins if you'd like. But even the roots of plants, and certainly one of the most highly defended parts of plants are the seeds. The seeds are plant babies. They're these little baby Noahs or whoever it was set on the river Nile. It's completely defenseless, except plants are smart. They put a bunch of booby traps in that seed. You know that dogs aren't supposed to eat apple seeds because they're poisonous. Well, humans aren't supposed to eat apple seeds either. They're totally poisonous. The seeds of things like stone fruits, apricots, peaches, those are all really poisonous. Those have large amounts of cyanogenic glycosides. The FDA actually regulates the number of apricot seeds that can go into trail mix because they're toxic. You can kill yourself eating apricot seeds. And those little apricot seeds look like almonds. And in fact, the almonds we see today are hybridized, detoxified plant seeds. Almonds from 500 years ago were pretty damn toxic and would kill you really fast. A lot of the plant foods we eat today have very toxic ancestors and we've hybridized the toxicity out of them, but the plant's intents are clear here. They're like, do not eat my root. This potato is totally toxic for you. Stop eating my roots, right? I, I like this. All right, I, got a, I have a couple little questions. Let's open up some more, some more loops. Um, Again, just to have, have fun dialogue, playing, playing the devil's advocate, I have seen a lot of people, there's the, the Gershon Protocol popularized by the German physician, uh, Max Gershon, about 100 years ago. It, it, the two main tenets of it for cancer are green vegetable juicing, using a non-centrifugal juicer, and, uh, and, and coffee enemas. Um, you know what else is part of that protocol? Hmm. Liver. 
liver. I could see that. We got some yep. good liver sausage inside or liverwurst. Um, then there's, I had an interview with Ori Holfmeckler who wrote The Warrior Diet and he talked the entire interview about the benefits of eating the seeds of fruit. And like we, so we know apple, for example, contains cyanide. There's a book called this, I think it's called the cyanide diet, talking about using cyanide strategically to create an adaptive response in people with cancer um, and, and, and uses some stories there. And then lastly, and, I, and I'm going to let you loose here in a second. I'm just trying to give you plenty of fodder. Um, we have the, the Hunza people, one of the longest living cultures, uh, a notorious blue zone. And they, yes, have high silica in their water. They also regularly snack on apricot seeds. And we also know that apricot seeds contain vitamin B17, which is usually used in dosages between 100 and 500 milligrams per day in people that are either dealing with cancer or want to overcome cancer. What are some of your thoughts and reactions to those statements? So we have to think about this. Cancer is a very special situation. Within mainstream Western medicine, in order to kill the cancer, we usually nearly kill the patient by giving them super toxic things. Just because something works in cancer doesn't mean that we want to take it every day. Would you want to take Paclitaxel every day? Good point. Uh, I'll take cancer it. chemotherapy? <laughs> no, right. it's a horrible idea. Right. And I'm not familiar with any unique biological role for vitamin B17, nor do I even really believe it's been studied adequately. If we go back to the Gershon stuff, these are all, these are not, these are not controlled studies. They're anecdotal studies of people going down to Mexico or wherever to do this Gershon therapy. And what are they doing? They, sure, you might see improvements in cancer, but they're completely overhauling their whole diet. This is my problem with a lot of the studies with plant-based diets. They're better than what? Better than the standard American diet? Yeah, of course. If you're eating a ton of vegetable oil and processed food, and you start eating a bunch of whole plant foods and eliminating vegetable oils in your diet because most vegan diets are low fat, of course you're gonna see an improvement. But long-term, I think a lot of vegans experience major stomach issues, pretty bad GI problems, nutrient deficiencies like crazy, mental health issues, et cetera. This is my problem with like a Gershon protocol is, look, yeah, if you put somebody on a raw juice diet, they also give them liver, by the way, which is part of it that everybody always forgets. If you improve someone's diet and you completely take away the processed food and you see a few people improve with cancer, absolutely. But you just changed seven variables. Mm -hmm. So which one, right? All, all which one is making the difference? And what is the long-term sustainability and health effect of putting those vegetables in the diet? I don't think that proves there are magical compounds in plants and people, we can get into polyphenols and all the studies showing that polyphenols are beneficial or not and why I debate the utility of polyphenols. But let me tell you this, man, cyanide has no benefit in humans. Cyanide inhibits complex one of your mitochondria and it will kill you if you eat enough of it. So there's the intent of plants is crystal effing clear here. They are trying to piss you off and prevent you from eating their seeds. To say that we should eat plant seeds is really to miss the whole point. You can, you can appeal to an argument with hormesis and I can go and, and debunk that if you want. I was, I, I was gonna ask I, about that. Yeah, let's debunk I disagree let's with that perspective it. philosophically from the beginning. Um, and the Hunza, I've never, been, I've never been there. I've never actually seen it. Uh, you know, there's all of these reports of, uh, of the Hunza eating apricot seeds, but I've never been there. I've never seen how many apricot seeds they eat. So again, this is just an associational thing. And it's like, well, you know, in Loma Linda, You've also got people who are vegetarian and vegan who live a long amount of time. People want to say, oh, it's their plant-based diet. But if you look in the state of California, Mormons also live seven years longer than the general population. And Mormons don't shun meat. So this is the problem with all of these epidemiologic associations. It just depends what, what narrative you're trying to push. I actually was a raw vegan for seven months, maybe about 14 years ago. And everyone who wanted to sell me apricot seeds would talk about the Hunza. So they would say, this is magic. Yeah. You know? This is the reason they live so long is because they eat apricots. He's like, what are you talking about? It's a, it's, Maybe it's it's a catchy that... yarn. <laughs> What's that? It's a, it's a catchy yarn, a catchy it's story. A catchy yarn. Maybe <laughs> yeah. it's the fact that the Hunza are indigenous hunter gatherers and they just live a cool life and they have community and they have water, which is clean and they eat other animals nose to tail. So who knows, right? There's all these anecdotes and this and that. I mean, but I will tell you like they're, it's pretty biochemically documented that uh, if you give someone enough apricot seeds, they will die. So 
Eating apricot seeds is a very bad idea for humans. Let's talk about the hormesis piece because this often confuses people. And I feel like this other person you were interviewing was trying to appeal to this, like, it's kind of this princess bride idea, you know, when, when he's yes. the down together and he's like, <laughs> I've slowly been, been increasing my consumption of Iocane powder. Iocane you know? powder. <laughs> it doesn't quite work like that all the time. And I'll tell you why. So hormesis is originally a concept that came from radiology and sort of environmental biology. In the environment, there are environmental hormetics. And I've never seen anyone make this delineation, but it makes sense to me and I talk about it in the book. Environmental hormetics like sun, heat, cold, okay? Even ketosis and fasting can be considered a hormetic. Sauna, um, cold thermogenesis. Sauna, exactly. These are experiential hormetics. They're not molecules that are being claimed to be used as hormetics. And we know that radiation is actually a hormetic too. A little bit of radiation does turn on mechanisms in the human body that increase DNA repair. But this is environmental. This is not a molecular thing. And I fear that this concept of xenohormesis, this concept of molecular hormesis has been conflated with environmental hormesis. When you introduce a foreign molecule to the human body, like sulforaphane, like curcumin, like resveratrol, I'm not debating that those molecules will have a pharmaceutical effect. But what is invariably ignored usually because people are trying to sell you yet another supplement and spin yet, an, yet another yarn, is that every single one of those molecules has side effects. They can all activate the antioxidant response elements. They can all activate NRF2. But the difference between cold exposure, sauna, exercise, sunlight, and ketosis is that these are not really exogenous molecules that we are introducing into the human body. We need to remember that if we introduce an exogenous molecule that does not participate in human biochemistry, resveratrol, sulforaphane, these are plant defense chemicals. Every single one of these chemicals is going to have a list of side effects that are always ignored. And in the book, I talk about many of these and I share multiple studies that show documented negative effects of curcumin. People lose their mind when I talk about this. What are you talking about? Curcumin is like gold. It's golden milk, right? It's curcumin, it's golden milk. Yeah, it's bullshit. It's, there are so many negative effects to the curcumin molecule that have, that have been studied a small amount and that have then been studied more and that are never talked about in literature. And there's some I, public I, studies. I barely take it. it. It affects my libido and function down there. And it's, it's been repeated multiple times. Negatively, presumably. Yes, yes. Yeah. And if you look at curcumin specifically, it's a polyphenolic molecule that the human body does not want to absorb. If you take curcumin by itself, you will glucuronidate it. It's a phase two process in the liver. You'll put a glucuronide moiety, your body will say, get the hell out of here. But all the curcumin now has to be packaged with pepper, which has piperine. And the reason they package it with piperine is because piperine inhibits the enzyme that detoxifies curcumin. And then you get 2000 more times curcumin in the human body. And the supplement manufacturers brush off their shoulders and they go, hey, ha, see, we made this super powerful curcumin supplement. And in fact, what they did they just short-circuited 3 million years of human biology that said, get that molecule out of here. It doesn't do any good for me. We know that curcumin affects DNA winding and unwinding enzymes, topoisomerases. It affects tumor suppressor genes like P53 negatively. It affects potassium channels called the Herg channel. It's been shown to do many negative things to harm both native and uh, cancer cells in uh, cell culture. So it can harm both healthy and diseased cells in cell culture. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. The same is true for resveratrol. The same is true for sulforaphane, which is not a polyphenol, it's an isothiocyanate. So what I'm getting at here is molecular hormesis misses the boat. It misses the point, it's myopic. It focuses only on the pharmaceutical effect of that molecule we're interested in, and it completely ignores the entire list of side effects that is documented in the literature, but that no one has to tell you about because it's not a drug that you are getting from the pharmacy. So. When you go to the pharmacy, if I prescribe you a pharmaceutical medication, they're going to give you a package insert, right? If I give you metoprolol or a statin, which I would not do for my clients these days, they're gonna get a package insert. It's gonna say, hey, when you, in, in studies, this, 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 this medication causes this many muscle cramps, causes this much memory loss, causes this much sexual dysfunction, causes this many palpitations, these many electrolyte deficiencies, 
when you it'll take help with your acne. acne. What's that? But it'll help with your acne. But it'll help with your acne, or it'll help with your <laughs> cholesterol, which isn't the problem in the first place because yeah. we've got the whole lipid hypothesis completely wrong. That's a whole different rabbit hole. But you know, yes or no? Do you believe that that was deliberate misinformation? What the lipid hypothesis? Not uh, yes. Uh, no, I think it's just very. I think it's people getting lost in their bias. I think that most people really believe they're helping people, but they, they can't see past their bias. If you look at that story, which again is part of the story that I tell with Nina Teicholz, Ansel Keys, and then the American Heart Association, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, I think there was some misinformation and there probably was some collusion between vegetable oil manufacturers who fund, I mean, Crisco funded the American Heart Association. <laughs> The, the reason the American go. Heart Association <laughs> came into being was hydrogenated vegetable oil company gave them a million dollars or something in 1913 or 1911. So open and shut and case, money. Johnson. What's that? I, could, I said open and shut case, Johnson. You yeah, said it all right there. A little, there. Bit, a little bit sketchy. But going back to what I was saying, this is the problem with molecular hormesis. Why would you take a molecule that has a redundant effect, and I can talk about that, when you, and, and forget all these other side effects? And so people will say, well, what about, what about all the benefits of these molecules? Don't we want to turn on sirtuins? Don't we want more glutathione? And that's the last piece of this equation. There's plenty of studies that I talk about in the carnivore code that show you can have totally optimal antioxidant status without any of these plant molecules just by doing the environmental hormesis and eating well. So forafane is redundant. It doesn't make you any better. And it has all these side effects. The same is true with resveratrol. Everybody wants to say it's a fountain of youth. It turns on sirtuins. Well, it also decreases your testosterone. So you tell me what you want to do here. And if you want to turn on sirtuins, just fast. Because we know that ketones are epigenetic. They modify histone deacetylases. And ketones can also turn on sirtuins. So all of these magical benefits of plant molecules are not unique to the plant kingdom. I've never come across a single one. People want to say, oh, curcumin is a beneficial anti-inflammatory. Well, where's the inflammation coming from in the first place? Why don't you fix that? <laughs> Why the hell are you taking curcumin, which is going to have all these other negative effects? Well so what said. we come to here is this repeated paradigm of plant molecules. They're redundant. You can focus in on them with a microscope and say, aha, it has this beneficial pharmaceutical effect, but that completely misses. It puts on blinders. It's myopic to all of these other bad side effects of the molecules, which have been documented in the scientific literature. This is my problem with molecular hormesis. Did that make sense? That was quite a rant. Makes a ton of sense. It was fantastic. What are the plants that you find yourself eating the most? I don't eat plants. None? None. Okay. So you'd mentioned berries, avocado, and squash. Those are gentler, but you still don't eat them. I don't eat them, but I've done experiments with them. I wore a continuous glucose monitor from Nutrisense, which is an awesome company. And I did an experiment for my, for my family, for my followers. And I ate berries, I ate squash, and I looked to see what my blood glucose response was. And, and I've recently incorporated carbohydrates in the form of honey back in my diet. And we can talk about why, but I've found that I feel way better without any plants in my diet. People might say, oh, honey's a plant product, but it's up for debate. Vegans think it's an animal food, so I don't know. I think of it as a carnivore, an animal-based carbohydrate, but um, there's probably some plant molecules in honey. There certainly are some plant molecules in honey, but I find it to be the most easily digested, the most pleasurable source of carbohydrates for me. But I don't eat plants, though I understand that 98% of people will want to eat plants, and so I wanted to give them a perspective on what the most toxic plant foods are and what the least toxic plant foods are and that's the tier one carnivore diet. The carnivore-ish diet is, yeah, berries, avocado, squash, the fruits, and meat, makes and sense. nose to tail. So we can talk about that too. Makes sense. Yeah, I wanna. We're gonna we're gonna come back to the meat and uh, and and what to eat there. So on the plants with with the honey, are you a local honey guy for some of the immune properties? Are you like a manuka honey guy? Is there another brand that you really like and find yourself using? Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I haven't really, I'm not totally bought into the whole Manuka honey thing just yet. Man, that shit is expensive. And I just, uh, I just like to eat a local organic raw honey. So I'm here in Austin. There's other honeys that I have that are not local. I like YS Eco Bico, but if I can get a raw honey from Austin, I'll eat that. But I don't, I don't know. I mean, I want to try Manuka, but at $50, the thing, I'm not convinced it's this magical thing. I mean, a lot of honey has 
has molecules in it that may or may not be beneficial for humans. So who knows? So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I yeah. read you. Okay, cool. And for someone who has seen the documentary Game Changers, sure. Um, what I'm sure you've, that's a conversation that you've had a number of times. What What are some of your responses there? So I did a number of podcasts on it. You know, again, this is all like a three hour rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. I did a whole episode of my podcast where I responded to the James Wilkes and Chris Krebser episode on Joe Rogan. I think that Game Changers is just, is a lot of propaganda. I want to believe that the people who made it were well-intentioned, but it's a lot of shoddy science. It's a lot of observational science. The experiments in that movie are total BS and don't even make sense and cannot be repeated. The spinning the spinning the, the plasma down has been repeated multiple times and people don't get cloudy plasma when they do this. And so mm. it's just untruth after untruth. And I fear that Game Changers will end up being one of the best things ever for the carnivore movement because all these people that go vegan will feel like garbage and then swing back and understand that they were so wrong. So, you know, I, I did a podcast with my buddy Rob Wolf and he said, yeah, you want to make an omelet, you got to break some eggs. I mean, I, it's, it's strong propaganda. It's just, I think people need to realize this. There's not a lot of science in Game Changers and many people have come out and repeatedly illustrated that. I've done multiple podcasts on it. Fantastic. All right. And let's, so let's, for someone who's listening and they're feeling like they want to give carnivore the old college try, um, what, what do you recommend? What do you eat? And then, you know, I would love to eat a couple grass fed ribeye steaks every day, you know, on the grill, probably, I, I think my food cost would go up substantially. So what, what, what would also you recommend to the listeners who are on a budget? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that. So in the book there, the largest chapter in the book is about how to eat a carnivore diet. So rest assured, there's lots of information in the book about how to do it. Um, and I do give those five tiers of a carnivore diet. So there are five, you know, I want people to meet it where they are. I think that if, if anyone listening to this is struggling from autoimmune disease or, you know, wants to improve body composition or libido or sleep or mood, then you can implement some or all of these ideas. And the continuum is really just this. I think people should start with getting as much well-raised animal food in their diet as possible, eaten nose to tail. So get as many meats and organs as you can in your diet. And a lot of people cannot get the organs, uh, but I do think they're very important. And the second piece is know which plants are the most toxic, roots, stems, leaves, and seeds. Eliminate those. And if you want to eat plants, include some of the, non, the, the fruit in your diet. Now, the one caveat I'll say there is a lot of people are sensitive to nightshade vegetables and nightshade fruits like tomato and goji berries. So don't have those in your diet, but other fruits are generally acceptable. If you wanna go all the way to fully animal-based like I am, then I think you can, there's a lot of information in the book about how to do it. You wanna start by thinking about protein. I think most people will start with about one gram of protein per pound of goal body weight which is much more than most people recommend. I'm 170 pounds, I'm 5'10", and so I eat about 170 plus grams of protein per day. One of the ways that I've found to make this much more affordable is not to eat ribeyes. I eat stew meat 99% of the time. It's $9 a pound. Grass-fed, grass-finished stew meat from regenerative farms is $9 a pound. And I'll blanch it in bone broth that I make or I'll just pan fry it. I love stew meat or chuck roast. It's not gonna be, it's not gonna melt in your mouth like a, like a ribeye or a filet mignon. You save those for your anniversary, but you can get really good stew meat for $10 a pound. So I think there are lots of ways that people can eat a carnivore diet very effectively, very affordably, but start with the protein, get a good source of protein. Like I said earlier, I think red meat is the main source you wanna start with, okay? Now from there, if you're going to, if you're not gonna include carbohydrates, you wanna do a ketogenic carnivore diet, you wanna get about one gram of fat for every gram of protein, which is a lot more fat than most people get. You're going to have to either eat very fatty meat, which is the expensive kind like ribeyes, or you're going to have to add fat. And suet, which is kidney fat, is very healthy for humans. It has a lot of a very special saturated fat in it called stearic acid, which has been shown to decrease visceral adipose tissue. This is the, this is the tissue, this is the fat tissue in the peritoneum that tends to lead to insulin resistance in humans. It's been shown in animal models that if you give them stearic acid, the visceral fat decreases. If you give them corn oil or safflower oil, the visceral fat increases. I can show you that study, it's pretty crazy. 
But visceral fat is associated with insulin resistance, meaning that the more visceral fat, the more insulin resistant a, hu a human gets. So, and it's also been shown that when you limit polyunsaturated fatty acids in human diets, the visceral fat decreases. So the key to improving your insulin sensitivity is to lose visceral fat. This is not subcutaneous belly fat. It's the fat that's around your organs. It'll still give you a belly, but you have to look at it differently with a DEXA or a special MRI. But suet, the kidney fat from animals is uniquely high in stearic acid. So this is something I'm going to be talking about a lot more on my podcast in the near future. It's super interesting stuff. So you want to make sure you're getting enough fat. And then the other component is getting enough salt and electrolytes and then getting your organ meats in. You simply Bob Wolf cannot... has his, his electrolyte product that could go well with your carnivore recommendations. Who does? Uh, Rob Wolf. Yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah, it'll go great. And or you can just eat Redmond Real Salt. Yeah. So the... Um, you know, you need to get organs in your diet. It, you simply cannot get the nutrients you need by eating animal meat, nor would our ancestors ever have just eaten animal meat. That doesn't make any sense evolutionarily. And a lot of people cannot eat organ meats. I eat a lot of different organ meats every day. I eat liver and spleen and thymus and pancreas when I've got it. I've got some testicle in the fridge I'm going to eat. And so, yeah, I eat all kinds of organ meats. Now, this is actually kind of the segue to... Uh, uh, project that I've been super excited about recently. So a lot of people can't eat those organs or can't get them. And so I'm just about to launch. When is this podcast going to come out? First within, week of August? Uh, we could time it like that. We could have it ready within a week or two. Okay. Yeah. So, so the first, by the, if this, hopefully this will come out the first week of August when my book releases, but perfect. We'll do that. The first week of August, then my supplement company will already be up and rolling. It's called heart and soil. And you can go to heartandsoilsupplements.com. And I'm, I'm really excited about getting people desiccated organs in capsules. So these are freeze dried. They're low temperature dehydrated organs in capsules. And we've got liver and bone marrow. We've got a beef organs. And we've got a bunch more formulations that are coming in the near future. So that if people won't eat organs or can't eat organs, you can take the capsules and the low temperature dehydration, the freeze drying really preserves as many of the nutrients as possible. So that's something I'm super excited about because I really believe that if more humans ate organs, we would be so much healthier as a population. It's, it's such an interesting, easy thing to do and you can put it in a capsule. So I'm, the key I'm is, excited about that. And yeah, I need, yeah, I need so more of that in my, in my life as well. So heartandsoilsupplements.com yeah. is where uh, folks can go when, when this is released. Yeah, yeah, heartandsoilsupplements.com. Nice. And you can order there. We'll link it to Amazon or wherever you want to check them out. But it's from New Zealand, grass fed, grass finished meat from regenerative farms. And we're going to be developing a U.S. based supply chain as well. So that's super exciting. But you got to get organs in your diet somehow and um, you got to get them in. So that's the carnivore diet. And I talk about all that in the book. You can do egg yolks or eggs if you want. You can do fish, but be careful of mercury. You can do chicken and pork, but do it sparingly. Don't make it the majority of your diet because of these polyunsaturated fatty acids like I talk about. And, and that's the majority of it. It's kind of just like eating all animal products. Now, if you want to include the low, the low toxicity fruits, that's fine. And if you want to incorporate carbohydrates, which I think is a good thing for most people, at least cyclically, uh, you can do that as the fruit or with honey. I found honey to be the best for me. Like I said, I wore a continuous glucose monitor. Lo and behold, Honey does not make you insulin resistant. Carbohydrates do not make you insulin resistant. It's much more complicated than that. Well, not really. I guess we broke it down. It's polyunsaturated vegetable oils mostly that make people insulin resistant. But yeah, I, I love honey. I'll eat about 100 grams of carbohydrates a day now, which sounds like a lot to people who expect me to be ketogenic. The first year and a half that I did a carnivore diet, I've been doing it for two years now. I didn't have any carbohydrates and it was great for the first year or so. And then eventually I started getting more palpitations. And I started getting more muscle cramps. And I thought, this is really hard to maintain my electrolytes without any carbs. And I just thought, you know, I'm going to incorporate some carbohydrates back in my diet. So I tried fruit. I tried squash. I honestly didn't love the way the fiber made me feel in the book. I debunked the notion that fiber is beneficial for humans in any way, shape, or form. And I don't like the way fiber makes me feel. A lot of people have much more calm in their gut when they eliminate fiber. So... That's a big deal. So I've just found that in using honey is, is really, um, you know, really a big deal. And for me, and it really helps with, uh, with my electrolyte maintenance. I feel really good. I don't get cravings. I don't crash. 
I still do time restricted feeding, so I will eat breakfast and a late lunch. This podcast is finishing up at about 3:30. Uh, Austin time. And after this, I'm eating dinner at 3.30. That's going to be my last meal for the whole day. So it's really interesting. And then I get a fast and I'll eat breakfast at eight or nine in the morning. So I'll get 16 or 17 hours of fasting. And I like spacing out my last meal from when I go to sleep. So that's how I do it. Yeah. And there's a lot of flexibility in there for people. And the key is get the meat, get the organs or get the desiccated supplements. And then make sure you're just eating the least toxic plants. Throw away the kale throw away the broccoli, throw away the spinach. You will thank me. Trust me. There are no nutrients in those leafy greens that you cannot get in animal foods in more bioavailable forms. You will feel so much better. Last question. There's, I have noticed repeatedly, I love ribeye steak, as I mentioned, and I'm, I, I do eat meat for, for me, the frequency is usually, or I don't want to say meat, red meat. Usually if I'm if I'm keeping it around, you know, big steak once a week, grass fed steak, I feel pretty good. If I start eating it a lot more than that, I've noticed my cognitive function is adversely affected. My energy, my body feels a little bit more inflamed. As far as I know, that's the only change that, that I've made. And it, it is observational and it is with me. Is, is that something that you've seen where people feel like their inflammation increases? I did have chronic Lyme back in 2011. I don't know if there's anything there, but I was curious what your take was on that. Like, I feel like when I've gone the opposite, tons and tons more plants um, and really eating clean, my brain feels like it's much sharper. My energy is better. I just don't like eating that way. I love steak. I love meat. And, and so I was curious what your thoughts were on that and what I might be missing. What kind of meat are you eating? Usually grass fed ribeye steak grilled, okay. grilled on the Weber. Uh, Whole Foods. Well, are you sure it's grass fed? I ask them for grass fed and they, you know, it says it's, it's labeled as grass fed. You got to be real careful at Whole Foods. Almost all the things they sell at Whole Foods are pasture raised and they're finished on grain. Uh, you think so, that could be doing it? Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. Think about what they're feeding the grains. I mean, yeah. it's very unusual to have that happen. So I can show you interventional studies. I'll, I'll show one here. Um, I'll share the screen. So this is an interventional study that shows exactly the opposite of what you're talking about. They, they replaced carbohydrates in the diet with half a pound of red meat. So uh, subjects were randomized to maintain usual diet or replace energy from carbohydrate rich foods with 200 grams per day of lean red meat in isoenergetic diets. And at the end of the study, they found that, um, that our results suggest that partial replacement of dietary carbohydrate with protein from lean red meat does not elevate oxidative stress or inflammation. So there's actually been studied in humans in interventional trials that red meat does not cause inflammation. I've never seen a single study to suggest that red meat causes inflammation. Now, what's interesting here is you are eating fatty red meat. My guess, if I had to guess, if I were a betting man, is that you are getting pastured meat from Whole Foods and this is finished on grains. And you can, you can email me back and tell me if I'm wrong and it's actually really grass-fed. It's pretty rare that grass-fed, grass-finished meat shows up at Whole Foods. There are other grocery stores that do it, but most of the time when I go in there, it says pasture-raised. And they'll say, oh, this is grass-fed. And they say, yeah, it's fed on grass for 85% of its life and then it's finished on grain. That's my suspicion, okay? If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but that's my first suspicion. That, that's that makes sense. That's a usual reaction. Most people feel differently. And if it is grain finished meat, that could be a very different thing than truly regenerative uh, meat. And is regenerative farms, they have a wide variety of grass fed, grass finished steaks, stew meat, chuck roast, suet, all those things that can be found there? Yeah, yeah. Places like White Oak Pastures in Georgia, Belcampo in California. Um, you know, I recently, I gave some, uh, I gave some stew meat to a friend of mine uh, from Belcampo. And she said, wow, this is so much better than what I bought at the store. And I said, yeah, Belcampo in California is like one of the best farms I've ever seen in my life. They're doing 30,000 acres of regenerative. But I mean, I don't know if we'll have the answer on this podcast, but please email me afterward and let me know if that was what the difference was. At I mean, I'm, I'm not even going to look into it. I'm going to get some Belcampo or some regenerative farms. There's some white oak pastures, order that up, throw it in the freezer. And I'm excited to do this. How long should I do it for? You know, again, you have to make sure I would definitely incorporate organ meats. I would try okay. it for a month. In the book, I talk about give it 30 days. Give it 30 days to see how you feel. 
And you know, I'm completely open to the possibility that, that plant foods work better for you. I'm not sure I understand how that would work biochemically, but I have to be open to that possibility. I just want to make sure that we're covering all the bases because uh, my suspicion is that there's some other variable here that we are missing and perhaps- I feel, like, I feel like there is, especially after what we've covered and, and, and a lot of the, the objections you've overcome. Um, I know you have to run. I want to be respectful of your time. Is there, are there any other big objections or anything that you want to impress upon our listeners before you tell them where they can keep up to date with you and pick up your book and stuff? The last piece would just really be the ethical piece. And I've done a whole podcast with Rob Wolf and Diana Rogers, who just wrote a book called Sacred Cow. I talk about this in the last chapter of my book, the importance of understanding that cows, ruminant animals have always been on this planet. Um, they've probably been around for 90 million years. They've been thriving on grassland ecosystems and not destroying the environment. In 1850, there were 250 million ruminant animals in the United States alone, and they were not contributing to climate change, just like they are not contributing to climate change today. I would encourage people to listen to that podcast, to read my book, to read their book, and to understand that the methane that cows produce is part of a carbon cycle. It's not new carbon. It gets recycled back into carbon dioxide, which is then incorporated into the soil by plants, which the cows then eat. This is the idea with regenerative agriculture, that if you look at the amount of carbon in the soil, which I think is the most important metric for the persistence of humans on this planet. Regenerative farms like White Oak and Belcampo consistently show that their amount of carbon in the soil is increasing. The longer they farm, the more this is increased. And this is such an interesting idea. And to me, it is an incontrovertible argument for this type of agriculture. The fact that we can regenerate soil, that we can increase the amount of carbon in the soil by raising animals is like, that's exactly what we need to be doing. That's exactly how you and I and future generations persist on this planet. If we continue with monocrop agriculture, which is what Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger would have us do, we will destroy our ability to continue making, uh, you know, to continue making food on this planet. We need ruminant animals to, to return carbon to the soil, to return nutrients to the soil. So I would encourage people to read about regenerative agriculture, to read about the carbon cycle, to read the life cycle analyses of these farms and to see that they are actually carbon negative, meaning that they sequester more carbon into the ground than they produce from cattle farming. So I'll show a couple things. This is a graphic from White Oak Pastures. This is based on the life cycle analysis. They sequester 3.5 pounds of carbon per pound of meat, which is soybeans, Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger. These are all carbon positive. White Oak Pastures Regenerative Agriculture looks to be carbon negative. It's totally different. And then this is an amazing graph showing the soil organic matter percentage and the number of years regeneratively grazed. You can see very clearly White Oak has been grazed. This is done at White Oak, okay? White Oak has been regeneratively grazed for 20 years. They've gone from 1% to 5% soil organic matter. That may not sound like a lot, but every 1% of organic matter in the soil holds an inch of rain, meaning that a soil with 5% organic matter can hold five inches of rain before the soil is flooded and you get erosion and runoff. And not only that, a soil with 5% carbon can sequester way, sequestering all this carbon dioxide from the environment more, and the plants and the root networks way more healthy. There's a video on my Instagram of Will Harris, a farmer who's sort of, you know, who owns White Oak Pastures, and he's comparing soil from his farm, it's 5%, to his neighbor's farm, 25 feet across a fence line, and that has 0.5%. And the difference in the color of these soils is striking. One of them is dark chocolate, Will's soil. The other one is like very light brown. It's not even really brown. It's kind of like red brown. You can see the difference in the amount of carbon that is sequestered in these soils. And to me, it's like, you know, whether you're in Wisconsin or Michigan or wherever, you look at the dirt, it's like brown dirt. It's good dirt. That's healthy dirt. You yep. can grow stuff in there. For you sure, for carbon, sure. It's brown dirt. You you have another meeting that you need to go to. I, I'm, I'm 10 second answer or 30 second answer. My brother, <laughs> my brother is a staunch vegan. You're, you're, I mean, I'm, I'm loving this interview. It's one of the, one of the more fun interviews I've, I've done in a while. My brother's a staunch vegan. Um, if he was sitting here listening to this conversation, what would you say to him? 
Why does he choose to be a vegan? Well, he feels better on it. He's had, he was diagnosed with Lyme disease recently in November, and he's almost back to 100% health. He's doing great, but he's noticed when he incorporates animal foods, he doesn't feel as well. It feels like they sit heavy in his stomach. He has more inflammation. And when he's doing a plant-based diet, he said he feels fantastic, like superhuman. Look, who am I to tell anyone how to live their life? If you are thriving on a plant-based diet, do it. My suspicion is that he's not eating high quality meat or he's eating other things with the meat or by doing a plant-based diet for a certain amount of time, you have become nutrient deficient in zinc and other minerals that are necessary to digest meat. Mm -hmm. So I talk about this in my book as well. The reintroduction of meat can be challenging for people because there are nutrients in meat, specifically zinc, that are very common you know, deficiencies on a vegan diet. And you can't make hydrochloric acid and stomach acid well without zinc. A zinc deficiency will lead to hypochlorhydria in the stomach. Mm -hmm. So it could be a vicious cycle. Now, if he's thriving, I'm super happy for him. But a lot of times when people feel better on a vegan diet, they, they're eating either low quality meat or they're eating other things with the meat that are problematic for them. Um, it's pretty rare. Uh, that's that's I, certainly the case too. It is. Yeah. 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 When he, when he goes off the rails, I mean, he was having ice cream last night and you right, know what I mean? mean like, so. <laughs> I want to say this to him, like, you're not doing this scientifically. Like, well, no, no, not at all. When I eat ice cream and a steak. Well, yes. And he doesn't claim to, he's not, he's not saying he's running it like an experiment. Um, you're, you're, this is fantastic. I'm going to pick up the carnivore code. I'm not going to pretend I read it like a lot of people do on podcasts, but I'm going <laughs> to read it after this conversation. And uh, for, for the listeners, what, where can they stay up to date with, things you're reading, seeing, books you're publishing, all that fun stuff, where should they go? Yeah, so if you find this content valuable, if you wanna hear more about it, please, the ask that I have of people is that you check out my book. Please support me with checking out the book. You'll really, I think, find a lot of value there. It's 650 references, it's already a bestseller. And um, it was, the first edition was a bestseller, now we're releasing the second edition to reach more people uh, through a broader publicist. So a publisher, HMH. So the book uh, website is thecarnivorecodebook.com and my website is carnivoremd. You can find the book at both of those sites, but thecarnivorecodebook.com will take you to the book and I think it's gonna blow your mind and I thank you for the support, my friend. Paul Saladino, this and you have been a delight. Thank you so much. It's great to meet you, my brother. Thank you, sir. Great to meet you too, really.